welcome back to Bumblebee, where today we cover drama like no other. The top 10 scandalous royal marriages that stained history. All right, it's everywhere right now, so obviously covering it first. Number 10, how a blind date leads to being one in a thousand. It's been controversy since day one with Meghan and Harry, not because they did anything wrong per se, not at least at first, more so the usual sensualization drama that has to occur whenever a prince chooses a cool Hollywood gal to be his biddy. As you'll learn in this video, this was not the first time this has happened. The couple met on a blind date in 2016, and the relationship was confirmed in November of that year, immediately initiating waves of hatred and bigotry onto the couple for the Meghan's ancestry career and how she even breathed. Really anything the media could latch onto. This onslaught is what promoted the couple to step back from the royal family in 2020 and instead splitting time between the UK and North America and finding their own financial endeavors. They also made the rare royal move to take legal action against paparazzi for the excessive negative tabloid attention. Part of which was exasperated by Meghan's dad sharing all her personal business with literally anyone who will listen. That's part of the reason Meghan only had one guest of her own at their wedding that contained thousands, her mother. Since their marriage, all the scandal has revolved around the Oprah interview, podcasts, novels, and broadcast interviews. But now, as of this week, it's coming from suspicions that Harry and Meghan are taking a break. This follows Meghan's 20 mil Spotify agreement being cancelled and causing apparent financial plight for two people that are already worth millions of dollars. Evidently, living all your lives out loud in this fashion from day one of a relationship will halt its healthy progression. But a source close most of them is saying that this time apart in different continents isn't a breakup, rather time apart couple needs. I want to follow that up with the very similar story of the American divorcee, number 9. Like the gravy and mash that the Brits oh so love, this is scandal ladled on a scandal. In the early 1930s, Wallace Simpson was married to Prince Edward was in line to become the king. By 1934, rumors had already started about the two having an affair, something they insisted that until their dying days never occurred. Anyways, when King George dropped in January of 1936 and Edward is crowned, he calls up Wallace who proceeds to immediately divorce her husband. This now made her a two-time divorcee, something the Prime Minister at the time stressed to Edward as being a bad idea. At the time, divorce was frowned upon, and the thought of a monarch marrying a divorcee, unheard of. Joke's on him though, because by December the Prime Minister is invited to the palace for a dinner where he's told by the new king his plans to marry Wallace anyway and abdicate. The Prime Minister and Edward's mother, Queen Mary, respond pretty much the same. What is wrong? with you. Edward's reign lasted 324 days before he abdicated to marry the woman he loved. The couple was married in France on June 3rd of 1937 and promptly shipped to the Bahamas by Edward's family. Why? Oh, well because the real scandal with these two is that they were Yahtzee sympathizers during World War II, a time when their own country was fighting the Germans, the same Germans and dictator, hint hint, that they went and hung out with and encouraged. Yikes. If you want to learn more about royal blunderings like these, be sure to take a second now to subscribe to the hive. And speaking of, number 8 will be about marriage to the ex-youth. Uh oh, if you can put together what I mean by that, y'all know this was a tabloid nightmare. Claus von Amsberg wasn't exactly the spouse people had in mind for the then princess future queen Beatrix of Netherlands. After all, when Claus was younger, he was a member of the Schmittler Youth and later German Army. This was already a problem for plenty of reasons, but the Dutch capital had lost pretty much all of its Jewish population to the horrific oppression and the now finished war. Their romance sparked a storm of protest in the Netherlands as a result. Claus was a low-ranking West German diplomat when he first met Beatrix, the then-crowned princess, on a Swiss ski slope during a winter holiday in February of 1965. They kept things on the DL until she warmed her parents up to the idea of meeting him, and to the surprise of many, Queen Juliana and her husband, Prince Bernhard, approved the match. Maybe it was because Bernhard himself was German-born, or their love was really that swaying, but I'd say part of it was the man himself. Claus initially was regarded as stiff and stern, and he worked really hard to shake off the habit he'd learned in his youth. And be vulnerable, showing a playful side to the public. He flouted royal protocol by removing a necktie during his speech and gave rides on the back of his bike during his wife's birthday. He also made himself favorable by mastering the Dutch language and learning to speak it with very little trace of a German accent. That, and he did give the Netherlands their first male heir in nearly a century. Well, he didn't produce it, Beatrix did, he just helped, you know. He's just Ken. The two remained married in, until his death in 2002. Now here is a name we all know well, but not for this reason. Number 7 is Wedding 
Absentasia. Marie Antoinette and Louis were married before they ever even met. On April 19, 1770 in Vienna, Marie's older brother, Archduke Ferdinand, was the stand-in for her soon-to-be groom. Ferdinand literally stood at the altar as Mary walked down. They exchanged their vows, exchanged the rings, juries out on if the kiss part happened, but it was actually two days later that Marie left the country for the real deal wedding and groom. If you want to learn more about being wedded in Absentasia, how that works and where it comes from, check out my recent vid, The Top 10 Messed Up Marriage Traditions in Ancient Rome. It's on May 16th of 1770 that she and Louis are finally properly married at Versailles, a day after meeting for the first time in person. As was the custom, the groom's grandfather accompanied the newlyweds to the bedchamber. He blessed their bed, kissed them both, left them to produce a royal heir. However, this teenage couple was hiding a dark secret behind bedroom doors. Not only did they not have a baby, but they didn't even try. The couple didn't consummate their marriage for seven years, and it caused a massive scandal. How could they not produce an heir? It was her job as a queen, and Louis needed to maintain the royal lineage. Historians have speculated why the couple didn't consummate their marriage all that time. So did the public in the 1700s, but the reasons are usually dumb witchcraft stuff. Nowadays it's assumed maybe Louis had a condition that affected his abilities, or maybe she experienced too much pain when they were trying. Honest answer? I think it's because they were young, the two probably weren't ready, and puberty probably hadn't done its thing and given them the drive. Either way, scandal ensued and the story ultimately ends with heads rolling. This modern blonde is a different story, however, because she came just short of being the, the runaway bride. Number six. As a wedding planner myself, I can tell y'all it's supposed to be tears of joy on your wedding day, not tears of get this bastard away from me right now, so help me God. Which was kind of the vibe that Prince Charlene of Monaco's wedding to Prince Albert II gave. Prince Albert and then Charlene Whitstock met in 2007 at the Mer Nostrum International Swimming Meet in Monaco when Charlene was an Olympic swimmer. They were engaged by 2010, but unfortunately, Albert really liked having extramarital affairs. He had two children out of wedlock, as is, and then, per Vanity Fair, to quote, days before the wedding, it was reported that the future bride had attempted to flee Monaco after discovering that Albert, already the father of two illegitimate children, had fathered a third love child during their five-year courtship. Then the video footage of their wedding on July 1st of 2011 pops up and the bride has just bawling. Photos where she isn't, it's evident her smile is painfully forced. Post-wedding and the paternity lawsuit thrown at Albert, Charlene has gone on to insist that the wedding was the happiest day of her life and she felt absolutely zero despair. Her crying was the result of being overwhelmed. Since plenty of rumors of more affairs, potential divorce, and separate homes have arise, nothing can be confirmed nor denied. And the couple remains married, raising twins. Here's a fun one, number five, the Cougar Duchess. According to the Guinness Book of world records, nobody on earth has held as many titles as the Duchess of Alba named Marie. She was known as a mover and shaker in the European social scene and regularly rubbed shoulders with everyone from royalty to Hollywood stars to ordinary people. With her striking frizzy hair, sometimes dyed red and most of the time white, Maria always displayed an eccentric, often outrageous fashion style. Throughout her 70s and 80s, she wore fishnet stockings and beaded anklets, paired with loud dresses and lavish designer jackets. In other terms, she's your aunt that refuses to age has no kids, a cool crib, and pulls up to the family function in a fur coat and leather skinnies at age 88. She was a badass. She was also married three times and widowed twice. What caught the public eye was that husband one and two were both younger than Maria. The second husband by 11 years, and then the husband she was married to until she died, that's the one that caused scandal. He was 25 years her junior, Alfonso Carabantes. Spanish King Juan Carlos openly labels Alfonso as a gold digger, hoping to get his hands on Maria's extensive fortune. All of six of her kids are horrified and do the most to try and stop the wedding. But the Duchess told Spanish radio, all of her children have been divorced, so they have no right to give her lectures on morality. I don't know why my children are causing problems. We aren't hurting anyone. Alfonso doesn't want anything. He's renounced everything. He doesn't want anything but me she said. The couple was said to have had a super happy marriage until her death three years later in November of 2019. And speaking of age, how about the new religion in at number four? At the beginning of Henry VIII's reign in 1509, the British crown showed no signs of wanting to leave Catholicism. Yet when Henry started pining for Anne Boleyn, who refused at first, like unlike the other courtly women and her own sister, to put out no matter what he did, it drove the man crazy with desire, right to the point he made the unprecedented decision to straight up divorce his first wife so he could marry Anne. The first wife Wife, Catherine of Aragon, had been passed down like a family heirloom to Henry when his older brother Arthur died. Henry wasn't the biggest fan and had already been denied an annulment in 1527, so in 1533, Henry just married Anne in secret. 
she's already pregnant with Elizabeth, and the ceremony took place in the middle of the night just before dawn at Whitehall. There was only four or five witnesses, mostly Henry's close friends, and then the marriage was kept under the strictest secrecy because Henry, of course, didn't have permission from the Pope to divorce, let alone remarry. When the Pope raises a fuss, Henry's reaction is to just casually declare himself the head of the Church of England and completely splinter the religion from Rome, thus starting a whole new branch of a religious faith. As if forcing an entire country to switch religions for your marriage wasn't controversial enough, he later beheaded his wife for reportedly cheating on him. Number three is kind of a cute story, the coupon dress. Though you wouldn't guess it by looking at the dress because honestly, it's the best royal wedding dress I've seen come out of British monarchy. But did you know, due to the wedding, uh, due to the post-war austerity measures, Princess Elizabeth had to use clothing ration coupons to buy her dress. Determined to get her dream dress despite the doom and gloom the empire was recovering from, Elizabeth, who was just a princess at the time, saved up clothing coupons in order to pay for the materials. She received an additional 200 as a gift from the government and most iconically, Brides to be all around England, excited about her upcoming nuptials, sent her hundreds of their own coupons. Overwhelmed, Elizabeth made sure to return these coupons to every single woman who sent one, especially given it was illegal for them to be given away in the first place. The dress was designed by Norman Hartnell, and what he created was certainly fit for a queen. Chinese silk, high neckline, tailored bodice, and a classic fit and flair silhouette. The ivory silk gown had a 13 foot long train with the pattern installed by a Boccacelli painting. The extra coupons, it said, went towards the extra materials needed to make it. It's incredible to think that the post-war restraint shown by the Queen in the last 1940s, less than a decade before her coronation. The scandalous nature of using coupons for a dress ironically was an afterthought, mostly pulled up once she became Queen much later to try and besmear her for cheapness. Speaking of Elizabeth, for number two we'll talk about the snub. I don't care for royal drama, but the world knows that Diana was a gem, so Camilla can eat it. As you know, Diana was the lovely bride of Charles the gross cheating weasel. To play devil's advocate, he always wanted Camilla and only her. The queen and other royals kept them apart, and as a result, poor Diana suffered. Once she met her tragic end, Charles went happily about doting on Camilla as per usual. And now in recent times, as we all know, he married her. That's really it. That's the scandal. Everyone hates these two so much, their marriage alone caused fury amongst everyone, including Elizabeth, who only begrudgingly allowed Charles to finally marry Camilla. Someone Elizabeth called that wicked woman and openly stated, I want nothing to do with her. And number one on the countdown, will it be Catholic or cousin? Which is worse, guys? Which would you rather marry? Well, in 2023, there's nothing wrong with marrying the first option, but you should not be considering the second. Don't do that. But George IV, Prince of Wales, decided married both. In 1785, George secretly married Maria Fitzherbert, a twice-divorced commoner. <gasps> I know. To make matters worse, she was Catholic. So not only was this match not approved, but at the time it was super illegal and technically made their marriage invalid. While courts and commoners and nobles alike berated the couple and scathingly referred to Maria as a mistress instead of their queen, these two lived happily together for a super long time. But the prince was a tad broke. He spent all his winnings lavishly and in order to set Settle the debts he'd built, the Parliament concocted a rather evil scheme. We'll pay it off, give you a new fortune, but you have to publicly deny being married to Maria. Well, he left her high and dry, that's to say the least. George is then set up by the same parliament with a dashing young lass, his first cousin, named Princess Caroline of Brunswick. The two were not attracted to each other, had nothing in common, nothing to talk about, didn't even like each other. A match made in heaven, obviously. They agreed to a marriage which was commenced on the 8th of April, 1795, the first day they ever meet in person. Thank you once again for tuning in and I hope you enjoyed. Be sure to like and subscribe if you want to see more from us. And until next time, what are your least favorite wedding trends or the worst wedding stories you have, comment down below.